a great way to kick off the Year of the Boar. Let's give another round of applause to John James. In addition to Happy New Year, I want to uh, welcome everybody to the Herbst Theater um, and also wish everybody a very happy Black History Month. We're thrilled to have you here with us as we celebrate the new Arts Impact Endowment. Yeah. It's been an incredibly hard fought and exciting time for arts and culture in San Francisco, and I'm so thrilled to now have the pleasure of introducing our mayor, Mayor London Reed. director for 10 years at the African American Art and Culture Complex in the Western Edition where I grew up. And there were a number of challenges that not only the African American Art and Culture Complex faced, but so many of our amazing arts centers and organizations and our arts organizations without facilities face here in the city and county of San Francisco. Here, we have a chance through this town hall to really examine what we can do better as a city, to make sure that we are more inclusive, to make sure that we are actually reaching those artists who are not completely familiar with the challenges of navigating the bureaucratic process in the city and county of San Francisco. As mayor, I am so committed to making sure that we are going through all 49 square miles of San Francisco and reaching in the depths of different neighborhoods so that we can make sure that artists have an opportunity to participate in the vibrancy of the arts community here in San Francisco. So we are here to have a discussion of how we can do a better job of not only supporting so many incredible art artists in our city that have yet to be discovered, but also making the right decisions of how we make sure that the arts community continues to thrive in our city. This is gonna be an incredible opportunity. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for not only taking time here today to provide your input during this great town hall, but also just the work that you continue to put San Francisco on the map for arts all over the world. People visit our city from places everywhere and we generate millions of dollars in taxes because people come here for your incredible performances, for your incredible exhibits, to visit our museums and our historical cultural monuments everywhere. So you make the difference. And tonight is a great celebration for the passage of Prop E, but it's also an opportunity to talk about expansion and what we're gonna do better as a city to really make sure that arts is alive and well in the city and county of San Francisco. So I wanna thank you all for being here. And I also wanna take this opportunity, and I know our city administrator, Naomi Kelly, will be joining us shortly, but I wanna take this opportunity to recognize Carrie Shulman and her work with Grants for the Arts. She will be retiring. <laughs> to the new director of Grants for the Arts, Matthew Gerdeau. <laughs> Matthew, we're going to be twisting your arm for some funding for our different arts organizations on a regular basis. You know, he served as 
someone who worked in the mayor's office of protocol for so many years, a lover of the arts, an understander of the, uh, understander, a person who understands and loves our community. He will be an ambassador for each and every one of you to make sure that your needs are being met and he continues to work to support your organizations and expand you know, the programs that we will support here in the city. Thank you, Matthew, for taking on this incredible um, opportunity and we're looking forward to working with you in this capacity. And with that, I'd like to introduce the city administrator, Naomi Kelly. Thank you, everybody. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Mayor Breed, for your kind words. I am happy to be here with all of you today. And, uh, and uh, I have to say, and Mayor Breed talked, it, uh, talked about Carrie. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Carrie Shulman tonight, who retired Friday as director of Grants for the Arts. Whether it was fostering an interest in art among young people of all backgrounds, whether supporting cultural events that make up San Francisco's unique identity, helping lead the city efforts to secure physical space to prevent arts displacement, or building consensus to protect the critical funding through the passage of Prop E last year. Carrie leaves a lasting legacy of service and support of San Francisco's cultural community that helps sustain the arts in, a, in the face of many challenges over the years. Additionally, a few weeks back, we also lost Renee Hayes, the Deputy Director of Grants for the Arts. She also retired. And she was an, uh, a, a backbone and support of Grants for the Arts over the last couple of decades. So I want to give a big thank you to Carrie and Renee for all their years of leadership at Grants for the Arts. As you know, Grants for the Arts is a small organization, and we're also in the middle of the operating support grant cycle, which the applications are due Friday. You'll be fine. <laughs> As you heard Mayor Breed, she made it very clear that with the passage of Prop E, that these additional investments will allow us to rethink the distri distribution of resources and money as equity focused in order to maintain a strong and vibrant arts ecology here in San Francisco. So together with this small organization uh, staff where we need uh, strong staff to review and help everyone get these applications in, do the technical assistance and also engage the arts community of how we want to see our funds being distributed. It was important to get a, someone to lead that office quickly and early on, and that is why I look to my longtime colleague and friend, uh, Matthew Gudeau, to lead Grants for the Arts. Matthew is a member of the Chinati Contemporary Council, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, the American Alliance of Museums, and a former board member of Art Care and the Friends of the San Francisco Library. Matthew brings a wealth of experience, knowledge, and a steadfast leadership that we will look forward to seeing with Grants for the Arts. So I, I would like to welcome Matthew Godot today, and I'm sure he's here in the audience. Can you stand? <laughs> now, as I see many faces here, it is a significant reminder of the overwhelming support San Francisco has in supporting our arts and cultural services. With the passage of Proposition E, San Francisco's art organizations will see a significant new investment, specifically $2.5 million for the Arts Impact Endowment Fund in order to address needs emerging in the arts and cultural sector. I also would like to give you all a round of support for your amazing leadership in the community on getting Proposition E passed. We will cultivate a shared vision for the future. We must be more engaging with our communities to shape and grow the arts and cultural identity. And with community input like events like tonight, and also the online survey, which many of you in this room participated in, and the uh, community open houses that I'm sure many of you attend, the community input will be very important to see how we move forward with the additional arts funding and how we shape the arts community. So I, like many of you, I eagerly await what is to come of our arts community, and thank you for all of your valuable input. 
And, and this input is important because it will help us reach people of all ages, all backgrounds, and foster the support of artist programs across this vibrant city. I want to thank you all again for coming this evening and enjoy the rest of tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi and Mayor Breed. We are so lucky as an arts community to have their leadership and to have them here with us tonight. They were here with us as we fought for Proposition E, and they've been critical partners in helping lead the way as we look to implementation of these new funds. So um, I have a couple of shots of us on the uh, campaign trail here. So uh, this was Mayor Breed at ODC for one of our call nights. Um, and it was just such a great honor to see such a coordinated effort. This is a historic moment for arts and culture in San Francisco. We had been fighting to make sure that we had the security of funding for years, and we did it with 75% of San Francisco voters. So let's give another round of applause. And thank you, Naomi, for being here tonight and for being a partner in this work. Um, Naomi has been critical in helping ensure a smooth transition in our colleagues at Grants for the Arts. Um, and I have to take this moment to really thank Carrie Schulman. She has been an incredible mentor, colleague, and friend since I started in this role and before I came to this role in 2012 and was appointed by then Mayor Lee. Carrie is just one of the most incredible colleagues one could ever ask for. Um, and she's promised that she is there for us and with us as we go forth. Um, and plan these resources. So um, I look forward to working with her in new capacities going forward. Um, and it's also an incredible pleasure um, to welcome Matthew Godot to the role of Director of Grants for the Arts. Um, we've already started <laughs> working together. Um, we've had a great partnership over the years in his role at the Office of Protocol. Uh, we worked very closely together to host the World Cities Culture Summit this last November. Um, and he's been on the Art Care Board, which is our Friends of the San Francisco Arts Commission. So there's nobody better to step into this role well, knowing exactly what it is that we do at the Arts Commission um, and bringing the political capital of City Hall as we look to advance equity in the arts. And so I look forward to working with you um, and look forward to helping you jump right in. So, um, and there's nothing like jumping in with a deadline three days from your first day. So welcome. <laughs> Um, it's now also my pleasure to welcome our San Francisco Arts Commissioners who are here with us tonight. Um, I'd like to ask them to all stand up. I think we got a number of them here in the front row. Um, we've got our president, Roberto Ormiana. <laughs> our vice president, Kimberly Stryker. <laughs> Commissioner Marcus Shelby. <laughs> Commissioner Lydia So. And our new commissioner, Linda Parker Pennington. And I believe Commissioner Mary Jong is here with us as well. It's such an honor. And oh, I've got two more. I'm sorry, you're, I can't see you all. Uh, commissioner uh, J.D. Beltran, our past president. <laughs> commissioner Chuck Collins, the chair of our Committee Investments Committee. And Commissioner Paul Wolford, who's on our Civic Design Review Committee. Did I miss anybody else? <laughs> Thank you. That's a great turnout from the San Francisco Arts Commission. You know, we have 15 commissioners, which is one of the largest commissions in San Francisco. And I am so lucky to get to work with this incredible leadership and talent pool. Um, and they have been here with us as we've been looking through implementation. Um, and I look forward to working with you all as we move forward in deciding how to spend all of this new money. <laughs> Um, they actually, uh, for anybody wondering about next steps, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, we will be um, on March 4th as a full commission voting on the recommendations you're going to see proposed for you here tonight. So we are going to be inviting everybody to the full commission uh, meeting of the Arts Commission on Monday, March 4th. So I will be sharing more information about that shortly. So as I mentioned, uh, we won with 75% of San Francisco voters' support. That is clearly a mandate. But you don't get to 75% support without some hard work and without an incredible coalition. And as I mentioned, this was an unprecedented coalition of arts and culture leaders, of individual artists, of arts organizations, and our partners in the private sector. So I would be remiss if I didn't thank those people who got us here and helped us get over the finish line. 
So I want to thank again Mayor London Reed for being a champion um, from the very beginning of Proposition E and for showing up on the campaign trail. To Supervisors Aaron Peskin and Supervisor Katie Tang, who co-sponsored Proposition E and put it, helped put it on the ballot. And to the entire San Francisco Board of Supervisors who voted unanimously to support Proposition E. Uh, get, yes, please give them a round of applause. I want to thank um, Carrie Shulman again, who was a critical partner along the way in the campaign, who helped us on fundraising on our personal time. Um, I want to thank um, Arts for a Better Bay Area for your leadership and advocacy in advancing arts and culture, not just with Proposition E, but by laying the groundwork years before, by advocating for new resources, for getting a million new dollars for the cultural equity endowment and new dollars for grants for the arts. Um, it really was a multi-year effort and Arts for a Better Bay Area was critical in that endeavor. I want to thank the San Francisco Arts Alliance for being an incredible partner and working in a coalition and carrying a large amount of the fundraising for this effort. Um, it takes the money to get 75% of the voters to uh, get to the polls. So uh, thank you for all of your work and support in the coalition. I want to thank the San Francisco Hotel Council who saw the value of restoring the hotel tax to arts and culture because it brings visitors to San Francisco and it keeps San Francisco the incredible city that we are. So they stepped up not just with financial support, but with their endorsement early on. So thank you to the Hotel Council. Also thank you to San Francisco Travel for their early endorsement, to the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, um, and then to our campaign team, to 50 Plus One Strategies, to Nicole Dursey, and to Schwedica, who worked so hard um, earlier on Proposition F, but then in Proposition E, um, to Jim Stearns, who joined in Proposition E to help lead the campaign strategy, and then a very special thank you to the frontline campaign team members, Otto Schock, and to Kevin Seaman, who worked so hard out of the campaign. I have never, ever felt better about arts and culture in San Francisco after working with this crew and seeing where we're gonna go together as we work towards implementation. It's just an incredible moment for our city, and it's a national model for making sure that arts and culture thrives in American cities at a time when we need it most. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so what does it mean? What did we do? Well, we have increased our funding, not only in dollars, but also with the security of a tie to the hotel tax revenues of San Francisco. That means we can increase up to 10% in any given year as the hotel industry thrives, we could decrease, but that has not happened but once in 20 years, so I think we're in pretty good shape. It means new money for the Cultural Equity Endowment managed by the San Francisco Arts Commission, which has been a national model for advancing equity in arts and culture for over 20 years. It includes new money for the city-owned cultural centers and city uh, virtual cultural centers, um, run also and managed in partnership with the San Francisco Arts Commission. It means new dollars for grants for the arts, for their administration and general operating support and other endeavors and it includes two new buckets of money, one of which we're here to talk about tonight. It includes three million new dollars for cultural districts to be managed by the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development. Um, and I wanna thank our cultural district partners for all their work on the campaign as well. I know we have many of them here, many work in arts and culture and economic development and are working to make sure our neighborhoods remain unique. So let's give a round of applause to our cultural district partners. <laughs> And it is why we're here tonight, which is the founding of a new all-purpose fund called the Arts Impact Endowment. This is a fund to be jointly administered by Grants for the Arts and the San Francisco Arts Commission, and it requires a five-year cultural services allocation plan to be signed off both by the city administrator, Naomi Kelly, as well as approved by the San Francisco Arts Commission. So what we have been doing in the past two months is working with all of you to meet a very tight deadline of early March, which is a legislated deadline, to come up with a cultural services allocation plan. Um, and that's why we're here tonight. Um, and again, this is going to be going to the full Arts Commission on March 4th for its vote. So we are on a very short time frame. So before we go into um, the data and what you all had to say, um, I wanted to set a framework by reading to you the racial equity statement recently approved by the San Francisco Arts Commission. The San Francisco Arts Commission is committed, committed to creating a city where all artists and cultural workers have the freedom, resources, and platform to share their stories, art, and culture. 
and where race does not predetermine one's success in life. We also acknowledge that we occupy traditional and unceded Ohlone land. Fueled by these beliefs, we commit to addressing the systemic inequities within our agency, the city and county of San Francisco, and the broader arts and culture sector. This requires that we focus on race as we confront inequities of the past, reveal inequities of the present, and develop effective strategies to move us all towards an equitable future. So that is our recently approved racial equity statement, and I want to thank you. And I want to thank everybody at the Arts Commission, on our staff and commission who served on the Racial Equity Working Group. Um, really, this statement is a continuation of the Arts Commission's dedication to cultural equity for over 20 years. Um, we have been working in, in this endeavor, um, both through the National Model of the Cultural Equity Endowment, um, but through many programs at the Arts Commission and in partnership with Grants for the Arts. Um, so this is a statement that is guiding our work as we move forward and looking towards the implementation of the Arts Impact Endowment. So now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our call, my close colleague at the Arts Commission, Dr. An Tang Dao Shaw. An is the Senior Racial Equity and Policy Analyst at the Arts Commission and led this community engagement process in partnership with our colleagues at Grants for the Arts and the Arts Commission staff. Um, so with that, I'm going to invite On out to give you an overview of what you all had to say you think these new dollars should go for. So with that, please welcome Dr. An Tang Dao Shaw. <laughs> and for giving me the honor, really, of leading the community engagement process to inform the allocation of the Arts Impact Endowment. Um, it's a historic moment in the city of San Francisco, and I'm so excited and honored to be part of it. So in order to meet the March 1st deadline of the legislation, the Arts Commission and Grants for the Arts had less than three months from the passing of Prop E to design and conduct the engagement process. Our objective of the process is to maximize participation through multiple platforms, but also through in-depth and targeted outreach to historically underserved communities who are oftentimes not at the table, um, and key community stakeholders who have been working to advance this cause for a long time. Um, to that end, we issued an online poll in four languages, in English, in Spanish, in traditional Chinese, and Tagalog. We conducted seven open houses in collaboration with arts organization and um, community partners in different areas of the city, including the Mission, Western Edition, Richmond, and the Bayview. At these open houses, the public had the chance to vote in our poll using iPad stations if they do not have access to computers or they would like to do it with other people. Um, and to provide feedback to a staff member using posters and having conversations with us as well. We also held three mapping activities with key community stakeholders in which we asked participants to highlight existing resources to support arts and culture, key challenges to the sector, and priority impact areas. And we met with a group of youth um, at the Ruth Asawa School for the Arts who provide us with um, ideas about how a future with a robust arts uh, education would look like. And lastly, we ask that you reach out to us using a dedicated email address if you had questions and ideas. Overall, 3,400 people participate in the process through all these different platforms. Over the course of three weeks, the online poll garnered 2,858 responses. The poll asked participants to rank the top three out of 12 priority impact areas, and the table that you can see here on the screen highlights the top four priority areas that has gathered the most votes from participants. And those are provide out-of-school arts education, support teaching artists to better serve youth, protect and sustain spaces for <coughs> arts and culture, foster proactive and sustainable arts nonprofit. The two priorities that also gather a high number of votes focus on supportive individual artists and cultural workers. 
Um, this information is amazing, and the participation really exceeded our expectation of 2,500. But as you know, data without context is only half the story. So we reach out to many of you, and you have reached out to us um, for more information about why these areas would be most impactful. Some of you might see yourself on the screen. Um, through emails, through focus groups, mapping activities, and post-it notes at our open houses, you have provided us with close to 300 funding ideas, which I single-handedly <laughs> coded into 35 impact areas. It is very rare that a nerd gets to stand on the Herb Theater, in the Herb Studio on stage and get applause. So I, I just want to acknowledge that this is a moment of celebration for all the data nerds out there. So some of the ideas that you sent to us refer to the funding structure of our existing grants. Those have been forwarded to our community investment team, um, specifically Barbara, who's sitting right there. Um, and our staff are already looking at them to think about how they can be implemented moving forward. We are especially grateful to a number of networks who have sent us comprehensive funding proposals that are informed by the work in their own community and their own stakeholders. We weighted these ideas sent by the network using the number of individuals and or organizations that were either CC on the emails or that have co-signed the emails. Um, I would like to especially thank Atua Beta Bay Area, the Asian Pacific Islander Coalition that consists of Soma Pilipina, the Chinese Culture Center, the API Council, and the Asian Pacific Island Culture Center, service provider networks like Dancers Group and Theatre Bay Area, and the Arts Education Network that was led by the Boys and Girls Club of San Francisco. It truly takes a village, and in this case, it took a city in order to do community engagement. The table that you can see here captures the top 10 impact areas with the most number of feedback. The top four priorities are affordable access to arts for its children and youth, funding for space and capital, core operating support for arts organizations, and affordable housing for artists. A number of funding um, ideas also refer to improving in-school arts education, and since this is not the jurisdiction of the Arts Commission, I will forward these ideas to our community investment team, who can then share with the school district and our other city partners who can use these ideas to improve their own work. I'm a nerd, but also a writer, and so I love words. But I also know that a picture can say a thousand words. And so I will leave you with this image that I have created using the feedback that I have received from all of you. It was such an honor to work on this process with you, um, and I want to thank you to, for giving me the chance to do this work. Um, I will now pass the mic and the podium back to Tom, who will tell us how this information is going to be used to inform the allocation plan for the new Arts Impact Endowment. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. I think that's a really good overview of the amount of work that went into uh, this process. And again, thank you to all of you that took the time to show up and to fulfill the online poll and to spend time at the open houses um, and to contact me personally on my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> I generally did enjoy hearing all the ideas, and we do um, want you to know that there's feedback for the Arts Impact Endowment, but I know many of you have interest in the other funding buckets, and we are making sure that that feedback gets either to Grants for the Arts, um, to the Cultural Equity Endowment Grants team, our Community Investments team, um, as well as to our work for cultural centers. Um, and now the moment you've probably all been waiting for, um, which is the proposed allocation uh, pie, if you will, um, again, the Arts Impact Endowment, we estimate in its first full year to be 2.5 million, give or take a few dollars. Um, the actual amount is determined by the controller's office based on actual hotel tax revenues, um, and we, we anticipate it to be a minimum of 2.5 million in the first fiscal year. And we were very lucky that in good faith by the Mayor's Budget Office and the Controller's Office, we did receive a half year, so uh, we did get 1.25 million in the last six months starting January 1st, 2019 through June 30th. 
Um, the great thing is, is that the funds in all of these endowment buckets now carry forward. So we can pool resources over multiple years um, for certain long-term initiatives, um, and it gives security to making sure we can be planning ahead. And for those of you that have advocated for multi-year grant making, um, yes, we may now actually be able to offer three to five year grants um, so that you don't have to write one every year. And I think we all like that. Um, so without further ado, these are the buckets that are on the table for discussion today um, and that are being proposed. Um, and this again is based on the data that Vaughn put together. Um, our staff looked at it, gave it through analysis, working with our colleagues at Grants for the Arts um, in meeting both with Mayor London Breed and with Naomi Kelly. Um, these are the allocation formulas that we looked at based on the responses. I think it's really important to note that the feedback on youth arts and arts education investment mirrors the actual polling data from the campaign. Um, arts education and youth arts funding was always the top polling messaging out on the campaign trail, and it was echoed in your responses um, through and through. So hence you see a proposed allocation of 40% of funds to arts education. You see 30% proposal for space affordability and capital funding. And you see 20% for arts organizational core support and 10% for individual artist supports. Now, these are broad buckets. I realize there's many ways we could look at how these resources would be implemented, and that's why you're here tonight, um, is to help give us some input, both about how could these resources within these buckets be allocated, but your thoughts overall on the allocations. So, um, this is based on the data um, and some analysis, um, and is also, I think, reflective of our thoughts and feelings about the needs within our arts ecology based on other research we have done over the years. Um, so, um, here's what we're going to do for uh, a context for some next steps. So, we are going to have a chance for you to all fill out note cards, but before that, I just wanted to contextualize um, what we'll be doing after tonight. Um, the goal for the plan, even though it's a five-year plan, we know it's going to take some time to flush out exactly the RFP or our grant guidelines within any given bucket. So, what we are proposing is, is that in the first six months, um, of the plan to convene working groups of field experts and community, community representatives like people like yourselves um, in each of the various buckets. So youth arts education, space affordability, organizational support, and individual artist supports. These working groups will review and discuss the qualitative data that Vaughn has gathered. Um, as she mentioned, many of you came in large networks and put together some incredible suggestions. And we would be inviting people in these working groups to review the qualitative data to actually make funding recommendations. And the new funding allocated at the beginning of next fiscal year, as well as the six months at the end of this fiscal year, would ideally then move towards um, some sort of competitive RFP process, but we're open to other suggestions as well. So, now's the chance for you to give us some input on these buckets and how we could best utilize these new resources. So, um, I'm going to put this back up on the screen. You were, I believe, given cards on your way in and hopefully some writing utensils. Um, and what's really exciting is we're going to have the opportunity for John Jang to return to the stage and provide us a musical interlude while you write up your questions. So it's, it's really uh, it's a win-win. It's a uh, so with your index cards, please use one of your cards to provide feedback on how you think the funds in each of the proposed allocations should be distributed. And then hold on to those feedback cards for, to drop them off on the table in front on your way out. Please use your other card should you have any questions for me to answer. And yes, I'm going to be bold enough to answer your questions in real time from the stage after John's next performance. So if you have any questions, please put a big question mark on the back, write down your question, and Arts Commission staff are in the audience, and after this 10-minute performance, we will collect your questions, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, so again, one card for any feedback and comments you have to be distributed on your way out, and then the other card or cards for any questions you have, which staff will be collecting in 10 minutes. Um, so with that, um, and we'll have about 30 minutes for the question and answer period, so we hopefully will be able to get to a number of questions you might have. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce this next segment of John James' performance. 
So among the pieces you are about to hear include Jasmine Among Magnolias, which is an original composition from John Jang, and it is dedicated to Senator Blanche Kelson Bruce and Frederick Douglass, who fought for Chinese immigrant rights in the United States. After that, you'll hear the Butterfly Lover Song by Chen Gong and He Chan Hao. And then finally, you'll uh, hear Who Built the Railroad on the 150th anniversary of the completion of the first transcontinental railroad in the US built by Chinese immigrant workers. So please welcome back John Jang to the stage and please write up your questions. All right, so let's see how I do. Um, so I think our director of community investments, uh, Barbara Mumby, is going to be reading me your questions and then I'm going to do my best to answer them. Let's see how it goes. I'm going to try to be nice to you, <laughs> give you some easy ones. Um, so here's one. Approximately what percentage will go to administration of the impact fund? That's a well, question I want to know, too. <laughs> Good question. Um, so just so everybody understands, every bucket that was approved by Proposition E does require um, that the administration of those funds, so the actual cost for um, city salaries, whether that be at Grants for the Arts or at the Arts Commission, needs to be covered by those dollars. Um, I, I have to say that honestly, we don't know exactly yet because it'll depend a little bit about how you ask us to spend the money. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, if it's the broader committee's feeling that we should have 10 new grant programs and they should all be administered by a public panel process, that is a lot more staff time, excuse me, a lot more staff time than if the recommendation is, is to move some of this money into an existing grant category, um, similar to something like our creative space program. So it'll have a bit to do with the efficiencies that are built into the recommendations. Um, and I think what we would ask is that the working groups who dive deep into these different areas consider those efficiencies. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we want the most money as possible to go out into the community, but we know that there has to be a transparent and public process in administering the competition. So all that's maybe to say a bit of a cop-out. We don't know yet. Um, and obviously, I would say we're going to definitely aim to make sure we're never over 20%, given that we wouldn't expect you as grantees to have too high of an overhead. So I think it would only be fair that we try to manage the same. So um, we will do our best to minimize that overhead and administrative cost, um, but it will depend a bit on the actual recommendations of these new dollars. Thank you. So another question. Um, could we see any of the funding distributed before July 1st, um, especially when it pertains to youth summer programming in our arts education bucket? Good question. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I see our community investments team looking at me like, be careful what you say. Um, it, it could be possible. I think the issue it would be whether or not we could grant. Um, so as you may all know, the Arts Commission, we administer all of our grant making through public panel processes. Um, that is kind of a standard the National Endowment for the Arts and other uh, many government agencies use. And that takes quite a while to coordinate. But I could see if we wanted to allocate some resources whether we used an intermediary grant making organization um, or perhaps issued a large grant to a couple of education institutions to regrant. Um, so there are some vehicles that I think could allow us to um, maybe issue some funding out prior to uh, July 1 might be tough, but maybe uh, we could try. <laughs> we'll have to see what those working groups want us to do. Yes. Um, can you define what poor support means for arts organizations? Yes, so we heard over and over again in the qualitative feedback uh, that people were looking for general operating support. Um, and I think we know as well that you are the all, you all know as, as people who run arts organizations and work in arts organizations, that often you know best where you need the resources. So um, what we heard from core operating support is what we might call in a bigger picture capitalization. So uh, general operating support, which has been the kind of uh, basis of grants for the arts support, um, which we know can be so critical for you to be able to be responsive to emerging needs, to growing labor costs, uh, to paying artists a living wage in San Francisco, which is difficult. Um, so I think what we've seen is the definition of core operating support is essentially could equivalent, you know, be an equivalent to general operating. So meaning that you all as arts organizations could um, administer those funds in ways that you felt were most necessary to meet your mission and to advance your artistic goals. Here's a doozy. 
How will you pick the participants for the working groups? That is a great question. Um, so we actually have discussed this because we're certain many of you will want to participate, um, but we also want to be responsible to make sure we manage com potential conflicts of interest, uh, being that we'd imagine some of you with expertise in any given bucket will want to apply for those funds. Um, for those that don't know, there is actually a city standard that you cannot, as a city staff even, develop guidelines and then be a voting member of the panel for a contract. So um, what we have done, I think rather successfully at the Arts Commission, as we've initiated calls for panelists so that we actually allow people to self-nominate. Um, many of you have done this and we thank you for serving as grants panelists. Um, so I know Barbara, we did discuss this I think a little bit and I think the idea is we will put out a call, um, we would work for grants for the, with Grants for the Arts in doing this, um, for anybody interested in serving on a working group um, and ask you which working group you'd like to serve on and probably define some um, ethics standards for conflicts of interest in managing potential conflicts of interest um, so that you didn't wind up on a working group that maybe in the first year you might then therefore have um, a potential conflict and that you divide the guidelines for that grant making. Um, and we will confer with the city attorney about that because um, we also want your expertise in those buckets so we don't want to um, eliminate people who we know have that frontline expertise. So um, we would definitely be issuing some sort of public call uh, for interested parties um, and then designing those working groups accordingly. Are you sweating yet? Well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so what does space and capital funding mean? Will it be to subsidize current art space or to build or buy new spaces with collectives, et cetera, or both? Well, I, I think we'd hand that back to the working group. I think we know there have been a number of successful um, space efforts in the city. Um, if you're not familiar, the Office of Economic and Workforce Development oversees the Mayor's Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative, uh, led by Lex Leifite. I don't know if Lex here tonight. Uh, Lex was a member. There she is. Lex is here. Um, so I think we'd ask the working group to be looking at some of the existing investment structures for um, space and capital. Uh, the Arts Commission has long administered the Creative Space Grant Program as a part of the Cultural Equity Endowment. Uh, we've been thrilled that with some of the new funding that you all fought for years ago, we've been able to increase the planning grants, um, pre-development costs, um, as well as the actual capital investment grants, which are now at the Arts Commission up to $100,000. Um, so, you know, I think we would look to the working group for those recommendations. Um, I think we're interested in making sure we're reaching everybody and we're helping support places where there might be gaps. Um, I know many of you are trying to find permanent homes. Um, there's some exciting initiatives that I know our staff is being briefed on. And um, so I think um, we would want to leave it to the working group to look at some of the existing grant making structures for space and capital, um, things that Community Arts Stabilization Trust is doing, um, OEWD's Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative, which I mentioned, um, as well as some of the work that the Northern California Community Loan Fund has done, uh, both with grants for the arts funding, uh, but also in partnership with OEWD. Um, so I think we'd be quite open to what that is. There's nothing in the Arts Impact Endowment legislation that precludes any use. So it could be for acquisition of new space. Um, I do believe that we have to start owning the land under our feet or we will be constantly having these fights year after year. Yes. Um, I know our, our colleagues and friends in cultural districts are eager to try to own the land under their feet as well, <laughs> under their feet as well. Um, so uh, there's some new resources maybe to match, and, and I think um, Matthew and I have already started talking about making sure that our private philanthropic partners are stepping up um, to match these public resources. So um, Matthew and I have already started a little conversation about how can we maybe leverage some resources for matching, and I do know that in space and capital, 30% uh, of 2.5 million in the first year is not enough money to even buy maybe one building, so um, not even close. <laughs> so uh, I do think we'll have to be strategic, and I would ask the working group to think about how we might pool money over years um, for potential acquisition funding, um, and, and I would really look at the working group for additional recommendations. Okay, here are two that are somewhat similar, so I'm gonna read them both to you, and maybe you can answer in one. So, Will each funding category have its own equity, diversity, and inclusion plan? And related to that, racial equity is a popular term in San Francisco. 
How will the Arts Commission be intentional in supporting the city's black or African diaspora art spaces, programs, and education? That's a great question. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about the Arts Commission's racial equity, um, not just the statement, but we actually have a two-year racial equity action plan that is setting out very clear outcomes and benchmarks for our work. Um, we are also working, we've already started work um, with the city attorney's office to look at how we can target resources in communities um, specifically without violating Proposition 209. Um, those of you that don't know, California Proposition 209 is a law that prevents the use of uh, race and ethnicity as a defined allocation for either government resources or application to programs. So uh, we're working with the city attorney to find the way in which we can be directed in how we allocate resources. And I think we also want to be data driven. Um, so we are, on has been working on some benchmarks that allows us to look at need in communities. Um, and we've um, are started to outline that in our racial equity outcomes in our two year racial equity action plan. Um, that racial equity action plan, just so people see the context, is part of a citywide effort through the Government Alliance for Race and Equity, which a number of San Francisco city departments are partnering in. Um, and we're thrilled that we have an upcoming training. I know Juan is working uh, with the San Francisco Symphony and others for a uh, racial equity training. Um, and I think it, it means many things. I think it means looking at the composition of our boards of directors in organizations. It means looking at demographics upon an annual basis after. We cannot use race or ethnicity in an actually qualifying factor for a grant application. But we can every year, and we have done this at the Arts Commission, and I thank our commissioners for helping do this accountability. But we are looking annually, after all grants have been adjudicated, who is getting funding based on various demographics. Um, not just race and ethnicity, but gender, sexual orientation, uh, the transgender community. Um, and we, I believe, we will be working with the city attorney to see how we can best target resources proactively. Um, and for instance, you can't say that funding is designated to be serving, cannot be designated to the Latinx community. What you can say is to organizations that have a history and a track record working successfully in and with Latinx communities, if you get the distinction. So um, we've been working very closely with the city attorney to navigate those issues so that they can be very clear, because I do agree we need to be very clear in what our intended goals and outcomes are. Um, and I will say we have, um, I know, not all of you have the time to come and hang out at our, our monthly Arts Commission meeting, but our Committee Investments Committee does look at that data every year after we do our grants at the Arts Commission. Um, and then we identify where gaps in community services happened. Um, and then this year, I think we quite successfully, we actually employed ambassadors in communities to go out and make sure that during the calls for proposals, we were reaching communities that were not perhaps applying um, in large numbers to the uh, grant opportunities of the Arts Commission. And I'm thrilled to say that we saw significant increases both from the Mission and the Latinx communities. Um, we saw almost a, I think, Barbara, what was it, a 100% increase to our individual artists. You're giving up all my data for the convening this year. It's Sorry. not going to be a surprise anymore. But yes, it was more than double for so, the indigenous community. So we have found these ambassador kind of models to be very successful. Um, we, as a staff, have a very diverse staff, but we don't have the diversity that we'll need in every community. So uh, we found that ambassador program to be working very successful. And, and I would ask every working group in every bucket to be looking at racial equity in your recommendations so we can be sure that we are setting clear goals with clear outcomes. I think this next question may not necessarily be to you, so maybe I'll give you a little break, but I think this is for On. How many people responded to the poll were from San Francisco? Do you have that data for you? I do. Um, 503 people did not give a valid answer. That means that you either did not provide a zip code or you put in zero or one, two, three, four, five, because as you know, we don't like giving data. Um, but of the people who did provide a valid zip code, 79% were from a San Francisco zip code. Do you want to elaborate on that? Or, no? um, I think that's You're good? clear. <laughs> okay. Um, why only 10% is being allocated to artist support? Great question. Um, it's, you know, we invite feedback about whether these are the right allocation pools, so keep in mind these are proposed allocations. They are not 
been voted on or approved formally by the arts commission or the city administrator so we are open for feedback if people feel like this should shift but let me give some context that was in the data in the polling data so we did that kind of mirrored the numbers of responses both in bonds coded data from the qualitative inputs but also through the poll and I will say it also has to do that the new one million dollars that the Arts for a Better Bay Area coalition fought for now I think three years ago for the cultural equity endowment a majority actually of those resources went into our individual artist commissions grant program where we were able to the first time in 20 years increase what had been ten thousand dollar commissions to fifteen thousand dollars so you know not an insignificant increase however perhaps way overdue and keeping in mind that these buckets grow over time or we hope they will as the hotel tax revenues grow so I think the question is you know how might we use individual artist resources to help sustain individual artists and so I think I would ask that working group to kind of look at you know is this the effective right amount of resources and then moreover how can we ensure that we're helping sustain individual artists over the long term I will say that there is kind of a model in government funding that the idea should be we're building capacity and sustainability vehicles not just that we're paying the base level every year because as cost of living inflates we will always then be obliged to be covering those resources so we're trying to make investments that build sustainability but again these are just proposals and I think the inference maybe in that question is that maybe that's the wrong allocation so something we'll take into consideration based on the feedback cards tonight Great. So you, I think you've touched upon this a little bit, but will funding for existing grant programs increase? And there was also a question about how can the individual artist category be uh, multi-year grant making? <coughs> That's a possibility. Great question. Um, so as I mentioned tonight, we're just talking about the brand new arts impact endowment. But Prop E did allocate as a baseline 600,000 new dollars to the cultural equity endowment. And so all those resources, we are eager to allocate them into what would be our spring adjudication for the cultural equity grants program. Um, I know, and I don't want to speak for Matthew, but um, Grants for the Arts new uh, 2 million base approximately in their budget um, would, I imagine, be something in consideration for their adjudication for the grants that are due, remember, this Friday. Um, so there would be new resources going out right away so I think it's important to note that there are buckets of resources that we're not discussing today in this pie uh, chart here that will have more expediency to getting out into the community um, in fact would be out um, as soon as you know J July 1 for our grant agreements at the Arts Commission um, and so uh, you know we are looking at a broader ecology so we don't want to just put everything on this bucket and say this solves everything, but we are eager to see buckets, um, those other buckets, cultural equity endowment, cultural centers fund, um, as well as grants for the arts, making sure those resources get out in an efficient and speedy fashion. Um, and there are new monies there that could be um, allocated quickly. You doing okay? You need some I, water? Well, You're okay? <laughs> I think I'm good. Um, are other city departments, like the Cultural Arts Division of the San Francisco Rec and Park Department, eligible, or will they be eligible for funding? Um, historically, city departments cannot apply to um, other city departments because we kind of see ourselves as, as peer government agencies. That's not to say there is the potential for work-ordered funds. Um, we have um, Grants for the Arts and the Arts Commission have in the past couple of years, we've matched funding um, and we've at times work-ordered over to each other's departments to support one another's endeavors. Um, Grants for the Arts continues to support the cultural centers, for instance, at about 440000 annually. Um, so it would be possible if there was a recommendation that we could look at a partnership with another city department um, and allocating these resources in partnership with that department. Um, but I don't see these resources as going to fund the work of another city department. Um, I would encourage you all to then advocate in the city budget process for those new resources. So, you know, there's always new resources to be allocated, not I mean, just in property. Would arts education funding be available to private nonprofit schools or universities or restricted to cultural organizations specializing in arts? Who qualifies and who doesn't? 
Um, I would move that part into the feedback section for whoever is on the working group for the arts education bucket. Um, I do, um, you know, you have to be a nonprofit 501c3 um, to receive a grant from the city and county of San Francisco. Um, and when you're not, if you're an individual artist, it is taxed as income. So for those of you that have received individual artist commissions, um, so there are some, you know, things to consider as we look at how the vehicles are for the allocation of resources. Um, you know, I think we would want to be looking at the need within either, you know, whether for, if it's a university structure or what the goal and the intended outcome is. Um, and there's nothing that would need to preclude them from being qualified, and that would be, I think, um, something for the working group to consider where the greatest needs are and the greatest opportunity. How will grants be administered, or will grants be administered through a public panel process? Um, the Arts Commission, that has been our standard protocol for the administration of competitive funds. Um, there are sometimes uh, projects in special grants and supervisorial addbacks that are administered through staff review. Um, other city departments like DCYF do, uh, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families do administer their grant making through a staff review process. Um, so again, I think it would be a good topic for the working groups to address. Um, I will say this, panels take more time. So uh, we have attention just inherently. Um, if you want money out quickly, uh, staff review is way faster. If you want to have a thorough, transparent process with public panels um, that are scheduled and calendared and the public's invited, uh, that takes longer. So um, I think that's something that working groups are gonna have to weigh to say if they want uh, expediency of the resources to be out. Um, it's not to say they both can't happen, but there is some uh, relationship between those two. Okay, back to space question. What is the current state of art space, like the availability, or what are the issues facing art spaces? That's a big, that's, that's a whole, a big that's a whole forum, right? Yeah, that's like a seminar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a three day, maybe a week long seminar. Um, I will say that almost all we hear about, I mean, not all we hear about, but a lot of what we hear about at the Arts Commission are space issues of one sort or another, uh, evictions, rent increases, um, we have a space crisis, there is no doubt about it. Um, we need to be thinking strategically, again, as I said, to own the land under our feet, and, and we need to be smart about it. Um, I would invite people, if you haven't signed up, there is a public program at SPUR on Friday, I believe at 11.30 a.m., um, and it is the Community Art Stabilization Trust, otherwise known as CAST, is launching, launching Culture Compass, uh, which is a, a jointly funded project of Grants for the Arts, the Arts Commission, uh, Office of Economic and Workforce Development, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, when we all funded Culture Compass as an online tool to better understand nonprofit arts and culture space needs, in alignment with demographics and the relationship to the city's uh, legislated cultural districts. Um, so uh, myself and Moy Eng from CAST, Executive Director of CAST, will be doing a launch event at SPUR. Um, I think there is still some space. Uh, you do have to register online, I believe. Um, but it's this Friday, February 8th at 11.30 a.m. Uh, to 12.30 p.m. at SPUR. And I think it would be a great chance for anybody who's interested in diving more into space issues um, to come and see that tool. Um, it's now live online, um, and you can check it out. But it's a great way to start to look at where concentration of space Art space is currently in relationship to public transit. It's in relationship to future development. Um, we are working closely with the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development to make sure that community benefit agreements include arts and culture space. Um, we've had some great success in the mission, and I want to acknowledge people like Deborah Walker and um, Dance Mission, um, Galleria de la Raza, um, Meta. You guys are doing some incredible work, Ani's here. Um, you guys have done some incredible work to put pressure on developers to make sure that they're giving back to the communities in which they benefit from and make sure that that wealth is, is shared. So um, that is something we will continue to do. Um, so I applaud everybody who's worked so hard to do that um, and to, to the successes we're having. Um, but I do think we need to do more um, and we need to be um, also serving the full city and taking lessons we've learned and applying them uh, throughout the city um, to make sure that we have uh, appropriate amount of arts and culture space, whether that's visual arts space or performing arts space, uh, rehearsal studios. Um, and then the big challenge we face is affordable artist housing. Um, 
obviously housing is a huge issue in San Francisco, um, and there is a huge pipeline for affordable housing need. Um, and frankly, the RSV came to the table a little late in our policy efforts to organize, um, but we have made some headway through some of Ons data work to make a case for arts, for the need for artist housing and affordable housing. Um, and I know we have a great champion in Mayor London Breed to making sure that we move forward uh, with affordable artist housing. So um, I think it would be great to have all these working groups be looking at how we can ensure housing, not just, not just workspace, but affordable housing as well. All right. Um, can funding be used to promote and encourage art support and the overall branding of San Francisco as the cultural center of the country? Um, yes. It's a marketing. Yeah. Um, well, Grants for the Arts have been a great funder of a lot of marketing efforts in partnership with San Francisco Travel for years, uh, both through the um, SF Arts Monthly, um, but also supporting SF Travel in their broader work of advancing arts and culture marketing for the city. Um, what's exciting about this new nexus being restored to, the old nexus being restored to arts and culture from the hotel tax is I think there's a really exciting opportunity to work with our partners in hotel and hospitality industries. Um, I've started some conversations with our colleagues at the Entertainment Commission, uh, the Film Commission, um, and I think as a broader coalition, we could be very powerful in helping tell the story of San Francisco um, and making sure that tourism continues to thrive and brings those revenues in, because the more our tourism industry thrives and our hotel industry thrives, the more money there is for all of us. <laughs> so we will grow as they grow, and I do think um, these funds could be, uh, through appropriate channels, be allocated to helping make sure that we have a very healthy uh, tourism industry um, and to be marketing ourselves accordingly. Um, and I think doing that as a broader coalition um, and making sure that our neighborhood arts organizations um, as well as flagship arts institutions can work together to be telling the story of what a rich, incredibly um, diverse and exciting arts community we have um, and tying that to entertainment and nightlife as well. And I want to pre preface this next one to say that I did not write this question. I had nothing to do with this question. Um, with the increase in funding and therefore grant opportunities, will the Arts Commission scope and staff grow to meet the needs of grantees and applicants? Um, I Well, it depends how fast it would grow, but I would imagine and hope that these resources grow. Uh, that the hotel tax revenues grow and that there's more money to get out to all of you and then concurrently yes we would need to grow staff accordingly that said just because we have the money does not always mean we have mayor's office but the budget office and the department of human resources approval so we also have to make sure that they're in alignment with the long-term sustainability of those resources um, but i do imagine that over time if not immediately but over time the uh, the, the staffing support would need to grow to better serve you all um. Okay, so the poll data showed an interest in after-school arts. Um, will the 40% chunk for arts ed then be directed to organizations and nonprofits to implement programming or to the schools to, do, um, to develop from within? Um, both are on the table. Um, the mayor and I met yesterday and we want to make sure that there's a needs assessment um, in that area just because there are significant dollars that come through the children's fund So thank you to everybody here who fought for the renewal of the children's fund which includes these um, sports libraries arts and music allocation to the SFUSD um, and then uh, DCYF has a record number of arts and culture grantees um, in their last five-year round so I think it's important that we would be looking at that data and seeing where resources are going in terms of in-school arts education versus out-of-school time um, and finding gaps. I think we don't want to duplicate services that the city's already offering, either through the Department of Children, Youth, and Families or through the San Francisco Unified School District. Um, and I think it's also an opportunity to engage our private philanthropic partners who make deep investments in arts education, foundations like the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation who are making very significant investments in arts education. Um, so both are on the table. There is no kind of idea as to where those resources would go. Um, and we'd be looking for advisement and, and drafting guidelines in that area. All right, here are two that I, are similar. I'm going to combine them. Um, how can art service organizations or alternative spaces or art collectives those groups that have historically been left out of the grant programs access these funds? Well, 
I certainly believe the arts organization's core support bucket um, would be a great place to see support for our arts service organizations. Um, we know with cuts from the Irvine Foundation um, and some other parts of the broader ecology that they have been left um, with reduced revenues. Um, so that would be one bucket where I could see support for our arts service organizations. I think for co-ops, I think what's really exciting about right now is we're seeing very diverse new models of how people want to organize. Um, a lot of people are not adopting the nonprofit 501c3 model. Um, I think it's exciting and I think it's a real opportunity to be working with our partners at the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, whether that's utilizing fiscal sponsorship from great organizations like Intersection for the Arts, um, so that, you know, we, we in San Francisco have more nonprofit arts and culture organizations per capita than any city in the United States. Yeah. Um, it's a great point of pride, but it also is a question about, about our sustainability and how much overhead and time goes into supporting the nonprofit infrastructure, right? Um, so I think wherever we can be nimble and coordinated, um, I, I've just seen a couple of really great examples recently of partnerships and mergers on back-end services. So organizations sharing CFOs or human resource professionals, trying to kind of build an economies of scale. Um, so I do think we could look at how these resources could be helping advance new ways of working together um, to reduce overhead and, um, and deal with the challenges. I was a nonprofit executive director of an organization when I started with a budget of about $400,000 annually, and it wasn't enough to have a CFO, but yet you had to have a bookkeeper, and then you had to do that audit, and it was really hard to kind of get into a place where you had all the staff you needed with all the expertise. So I think we would be benefiting as a sector to start to look at how do we work together? Um, you know, are there new shared business models? Um, I know the Heller Foundation has funded a couple of uh, back-end partnerships where um, supporting particularly arts education organizations um, and sharing uh, you know, a CFO, for instance, among two organizations. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a merger or even a fiscal sponsorship. I think there's some really exciting opportunities um, that we're seeing out in the sector to uh, to be more efficient and to, to be better resourced and, and nimble. Great. Will the funds be distributed from the Arts Commission, grants for the arts, or another agency? Well, Matthew and I are going to arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we, it could be either grants for the arts or the Arts Commission or a partnership. So um, the funds are in the budget of the San Francisco Arts Commission. Um, and we could administer them in any number of ways. As I mentioned, we've work ordered funds before between city departments, um, but uh, they are currently in the, the le legislative structure in the budget of the San Francisco Arts Commission. So it would be um, something in the plan and the final working group recommendations to figure out where they would, they would go. Um, I would imagine most likely they would be between the Arts Commission and grants for the arts. I've been told you have one more question to answer, so I'm going to try to make it a, the same note. a doozy here. Okay. I'm going to read them both because I, I don't know if I can combine them accurately. What is the distribution of funds between small, medium, and large organizations? Will it go to predominantly larger organizations like the ballet? Um, and how will the fund ensure that communities of color and small and mid-sized organizations will benefit from the additional funds? So how do we ensure that equity and parity with organizational sizes? Um, there's nothing in the legislation that sets a budget size for any of the allocation of these resources. Um, so I think we would be looking again for recommendations. Um, one of the most amazing things about the coalition that passed Proposition E was the unbelievable coordination among organizations that historically had fought each other in the city and county of San Francisco to be blunt for resources. There, as we mentioned in our racial equity statement, as we're committed to, there are histories of oppression that we need to work to advance racial equity in the city and county of San Francisco. And I personally believe we have to do that in organizations of every size and at the same time ensure that individual artists and small and mid-sized budget organizations have the resources they need to compete in a market space in a city where affordability is a real challenge and where the needs can be much more pressing in terms of vulnerabilities. So um, we certainly are gonna be looking at all recommendations through the racial equity lens um, and making sure that we set standards. Um, I would ask the working groups to be looking at budget caps. The Arts Commission, as many of you know, has a budget cap 
I maybe hasn't kept up with inflation, so some of you I know have had feedback, which we're taking very seriously, that you have capped out of our, you know, a budget cap of 1.1 million. Uh, 1.1 million today is not what it was 15 years ago. Um, 1.5 million. Now it's 1.5, yes. We two for a previous space. Thank you. So um, we've tried to keep up with the times, um, but it is still a tension. So I think what we'd be looking for is the working groups. Thank you, Barbara, for correcting me on that. Um, so we, uh, we would be looking to the working groups to kind of recommend, depending on what the uses were going to be, whether or not those guidelines should have a budget cap, and, and that would advance our efforts towards racial equity. Um, but I, I would hope that we could be looking at advancing racial equity throughout the arts ecology um, and across budget sizes, uh, while also ensuring dedicated resources for um, smaller budget institutions and emerging institutions and organizations. So. Um, I believe that was the last question. You're done. All right. Great. I think somebody even brought me a glass of water. I didn't see that. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. That was. Those are incredible questions. Um, so just a reminder: if you have feedback, whether you maybe don't buy into this set of allocations. Please make sure on your way out you give them at the table. Um, we are going to make sure that we scan all of them and get that qualitative feedback in so that the working groups can get um, all the information that you've provided. Um, and before we leave today, I do just have a couple of announcements of uh, upcoming deadlines and dates that I have mentioned already, but just to remind you of all of them. Uh, an important meeting will be the full Arts Commission meeting on Monday, March 4th, 2 p.m. in City Hall, room 416. Uh, this is the meeting where the Arts Commission, um, given the deadline, will have to vote on the proposed allocation plan. Um, so we're going to take feedback from your cards today, see if any adjustments are necessary, um, make sure we communicate out in advance of this meeting what it is that the Commission would be voting on before um, before we actually have to take the vote. Um, and of course, we'll be working with the city administrator, um, and Matthew is the director of grants for the arts and, and his team uh, to get everybody's uh, approval and buy-in. So, uh, very important meeting. Um, but just remember that when the plan is passed, there's still gonna be the working groups and the work to get, to get us to actual implementation. And we do plan to build in an evaluation vehicle so that we can revisit the plan, not just every five years, but throughout the plan to um, implementation of five years to make sure we're successful. Um, and then a reminder, Grants for the Arts deadline for their general operating support grant this Friday, February 8th at 11.59 p.m. Um, the Arts Commission and Grants for the Arts are now on a new Salesforce system, so I appreciate everybody who at Grants for the Arts is trailblazing on the new system. For those of you wondering why on earth we have switched systems again in two years, Go Grants was discontinued, so in our good effort to uh, align with the National Endowment for the Arts and the California Arts Council so that you all would learn one system, uh, we unfortunately have no choice but to seek a new um, technical system. So. Thank you to Grants for the Arts for trailblazing with Salesforce. Um, when you have the uh, Arts Commission guidelines coming out this summer, we will also be on the same system. Um, and then finally, uh, just an announcement, the Arts Commission's uh, Public Art Pre-Qualified Artist Pool is now accepting applications with a deadline of March 7th. Uh, no public art experience is necessary. We really encourage you, no matter what your medium is, is to apply um, and get into that pool. This is for the public art commissions generated by the 2% for art enrichment ordinance. Um, for those of you that don't know, since 1969, 2% of hard construction costs on every city building project goes towards arts in those buildings. Um, the Arts Commission administers that. So uh, that deadline again is March 7th. And if you want to learn more, we have a workshop tomorrow. Uh, February 7th from 6 to 8 p.m. And if you go to the opportunity section of the Arts Commission website, you can register for that workshop and learn a little bit more about how you can uh, get involved in our public art program. Um, so with that, thank you so much for coming this evening. And again, thank you to everybody who made this incredible opportunity happen. Um, this is an ongoing dialogue. Um, please do drop your feedback cards out front. And again, a big round of applause to John Jang for an incredible set tonight. <laughs> We hope to see you on March 4th, if not sooner. So thank you so much and have a good night.